This time on Watchers of Tomorrow, I'd have fired the director too. Hello, welcome to Watchers of Tomorrow, the sci-fi review and critique show that shares a striking similarity to certain old Earth cultures. I am Gepwin, and I'm joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, Dr. Izix. Hi! And you no. Know, uh, yeah. I think we're going to just skip this one. So next week is <laughs> uh, Last Outpost. <laughs> uh, yeah, Gepwin, can, can we really skip what is the episode that I usually skip on my rewatches of TNG? <laughs> I mean, the the episode itself is really cringe and bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't have a lot to recommend it. <laughs> yeah, and that's just so. like like the the, uh, uh, the the script itself. You know, it's just like here's an awkward statement that doesn't make sense for anyone to ever say, and then it gets worse from there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we are doing um, Code of Honor, which is widely regarded by. The uh, the the fans, the staff, the the crew, Jonathan Franks, everyone specifically, <laughs> yeah, everyone has has basically come out and said that uh, this is their least favorite episode of Next Generation overall, just full on. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just what were they thinking? Yeah, like seriously, I know there's a good portion of it that goes to the director and the writer here, but still, it's just such a pile up of bad well still like well yes the 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 writer wrote something bad and the director mm-hmm. did something horrible um yes. the producers still okayed this and decided to put it into production yeah like they they decided like the freaking berman decided to okay this episode for production which should have been like a, a big red flag to everyone that Berman's maybe not the best person <laughs> and and he did not okay the two or three more gay centered scripts that i know mm-hmm. he had on his desk at this point yes so uh, i guess we can f- quite clearly see where uh his priorities are as far as what's an acceptable thing to put on tv yeah so so just to, uh, to to make it clear to everyone, this episode is kind of racist, racist as hell. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're going to have to try to talk about it. We're going to have to try to be two white dudes talking about racism. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to do our best, but, you know, this just a kind of a pre-warning on the yeah. whole freaking episode. Yeah. Uh, this is the double face palm, uh, you know, uh, card Riker moment here, just as a whole episode, you know? So, uh... We should probably start with like who's responsible for this nonsense, right? <laughs> yeah this this episode was uh, written by Catherine Powers and her writing partner Michael Barron. Uh, there's not a lot of information about him. He uh, he seems to be mostly the writing partner. She was a friend of DC Fontana, which is why she was able to pitch the story during mm-hmm. uh, early Next Generation development. Uh, she'd mostly written uh, like other TV shows. She's done a few things like Fantasy Island and Airwolf, and she would later write an episode of DS9. Uh, yes. Also, uh, particularly notably, given that quick rundown for this to make sense, this is an episode about a strong, independent blonde woman being kidnapped and forced into a fight to the death because of a patriarchal power struggle. She would later mm-hmm. go on to write the Stargate SG-1 first season episode Emancipation about a strong blonde woman being kidnapped and forced into a fight to the death because of a patriarchal power struggle. Yes. Uh, It's just so much copy-paste, it's ridiculous. Yeah. (laughs) But that time, the blonde white woman uh, uh, fights uh, her captor as opposed to just some other person. Yeah, just some random person. So yeah, they did that. They're like, <laughs> she's going to have to, f- like, some champion is going to have to fight. Oh, she's her own champion. We're allowing this for some reason. Because she's a, a chief herself. Yeah, because Daniel said that early in the episode. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Sorry for everyone. We're being kind of slow about all this here. <laughs> but this, this, how do we even talk about this? <laughs> I mean, so the script itself, um, poorly written and misogynistic. Mm-hmm. Yes. The, the script. And also the original script, I should point out, 
um, featured reptiles who practiced a samurai honor code. So uh, uh, very specific uh, sort of uh, implications of you know what, what culture we're sort of emulating here, yes. Yeah, so we started with samurai lizards. Keep that in mind as we move forward. Samurai lizards. Yes. Samurai lizards, all right. So, uh, so what, what happened then? Yeah, so let's do a quick kind of rundown here. I normally don't talk about uh, directors in these things. It's not my forte. They don't do the they aren't doing the writing, and that's what we're mostly talking about. Um, yeah, they they do have impact on episodes sometimes a lot more than others. This is definitely one of the ones where it's yeah. a lot more than others. So the original director of the episode, Russ Mayberry, uh, did all of the casting, and he made the decision to cast the alien race in this uh, episode entirely with an african-american cast indeed so uh so so are they still lizard people no they're not lizard people they're just mm. apparently some sort of alien tribal africans is the yes. only vibe that you can really get um and and not even anything specific we'll get into it a bit but a lot of the costuming uh set design way that they act is vaguely tribal racism that you can't really point to specifically any any one particular area in, even in africa or even asia adjacent yeah. areas like they sort of mishmash a bunch of stuff and aesthetics together mm -hmm. it's like uh you got a like a 1910s uh a comic where someone you know goes to visit africa and meets the king there and yeah it's just whatever they decide to dress that person up in uh yeah. Except, you know, done in the 80s instead. <laughs> so uh, he was, in fact, fired personally by Gene Roddenberry mm -hmm. halfway through filming the episode, purportedly because of the very racist casting decisions. But some actors on set say that he was also behaving racistly towards the African-American cast members. Yeah, that's, that's a double uh, whammy of bad signs that maybe this guy shouldn't have this job or jobs in general where he's in charge of people yeah but he was fired and i don't know any of the actual details but i imagine since he was fired halfway through the episode they probably were already filming they probably already had contracts signed i'm sure there was a whole thing so they had to move forward at that point they'd already invested too much of their tv budget now i should point out that gene roddenberry specifically fired russ uh, mayberry so you know, is you know, Gene, Bar uh, gene roddenberry has a lot of complicated stuff involving him and uh, you know his own behavior but he even he could be like, no, this is just too awful even for me. So uh, get out of here. So it gives you some idea of how transparently, blatantly, obviously awful it was. Mm -hmm. All right. We've gotten that out of the way for the minute. We're going to do a really quick cast rundown so that we can just have that done. Uh, that's the main controversy of the episode. And then we're going to have yes. to try to unpack it later, which I'm not looking forward to. But there we Indeed. are. Fingers crossed. I'll say this: at least it's not the uh, at least it's not the original series uh, Evil Kirk episode. Yes. No. Uh, yeah. There's. I'd say that this is a different scale of uncomfortable, uh, but it is. There is some some crossover there. Yeah. Why does Star Trek keep putting these so early in the series? Shrug. All right. Main guest stars this time are uh, Jesse Lawrence Ferguson, who plays Lutan. Uh, he was in a lot of contemporary TV shows and movie projects in the 80s and 90s. He was on a lot of cop shows and uh, sci-fi shows and movies, including Buck Rogers. Um, he was in the A-Team and something called Cop Rock. <laughs> cop Rock Part Cop. <laughs> he was in a movie that we'll probably wind up covering at some point called Buckaroo Banzai. Oh, yeah. That's on my short list. <laughs> <laughs> he was also in Dark Man. Oh yeah, Dark Man, which I also enjoy, um, and something that I just had to had to add because it's called the Fist that Saved Pittsburgh. <laughs> nice. Um, he, I haven't seen this, but apparently he's uh, pretty well known for playing Officer Kofi or Coffee. I'm not sure how they pronounce it because I haven't seen it in uh, Boys in the Hood. Oh, yeah. We also have Carol Selman, uh, who plays Yarina. She began acting in the 70s um, in a uh, comedy called Piece of the Action, not the old... Not the Star Trek episode, yeah. Original series Star <laughs> Trek episode, Piece of the Action. Uh, she also guest starred in Roots alongside LeVar Burton. And um, 
was also in something called The White Show with Jonathan Frakes. Huh. Didn't catch that one. That, that, that Jonathan Frakes was in it specifically, but yeah, I spotted that. She was in The White Show. Um, she was also in uh, you know, some other stuff like uh, Hill Street Blues. Uh, she took the 90s off, but uh, before that, uh, she was in a TV movie called Roe vs. Wade. Oh, fun. <laughs> I'm actually kind of curious to see that now. Finally, for the main guest stars, uh, James Lewis Watkins as Hagen. He was in a lot of TV and film roles in the 70s, same as everybody. Um, was also in a lot of uh, contemporary black exploitation movies. One of the actors who was being considered to play Worf, and he later got to be a Cardassian in DS9. Now, uh, James Lewis Watkins also is also known as Julian Christopher. So uh, if the, you're uh, more familiar with that name, that's... Uh... Yeah, because of the same guy. And that's everybody. A lot of people, a lot of people who showed up as guest stars in the first season were actors who were in consideration to play other characters. Like we're going to get the get one of the people who was shortlisted for Data in a couple of episodes. Uh, they also uh, got uh, the uh, the actor that plays Data for one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get to, uh, Data lore when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but yeah, so uh, this is a uh, there's also a number of background characters, of course, uh, but uh, I don't think any of them have speaking roles except for maybe like the guy that screams in pain as he's dying. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> they, we've gotten to the place in the budget of these shows where we can't name every single background actor because it's just too many people. Mm-hmm. All right. So the Enterprise has gotten to the planet League on two which is a slightly less technologically advanced planet, but it does have access to a very rare vaccine that's desperately needed for a pandemic on a planet called Steers 4, which we're doing the pandemic vaccine thing again. Yep, uh, once again, uh, it was a, a favorite trope in uh, the original series, and it just keeps going back in TNG, too. Yeah, isn't it cute how they thought a vaccine was the only thing you needed to take care of a global pandemic? Yeah, and then, you know, they're not, you know... Uh, you know, various actions and uh, societal engineering and, you know, encouraging certain behaviors to uh, decrease spread and all that sort of stuff. But anyway. <laughs> Picard is tasked with opening diplomatic relations and procuring the vaccine. The Lagosians beam themselves aboard to show off that they indeed do have a transporter. And they arrive mm-hmm. with their own red carpet. Yes, uh, I also want to point out that uh, they uh, beam onto a big X on the on the ground that looks suspiciously like the X-Men logo. So, uh, you know, Picard has that, uh, you know, you know, you know <laughs> to look forward to in the future. Yeah, it's so. foreshadowing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they're dressed in sort of a African Eastern inspired garb that's manages to be sort of generally non-specifically racist. Mm-hmm. So you got the turbans, you got the, I guess, MC hammer pants thing going on and vests yeah. and, and we got spears, I guess. Yeah. Kind of. Mm-hmm. Uh, so their leader, Lou Tan, is impressed that Lieutenant Yar is here to do security stuff because in their world, women don't do things like that. Yes, uh, women only hold ownership of land, but everything else, uh, including running the land and, you know, all the business, I guess, on it, uh, is done by the men. Yeah. Uh, Hagen, who is his second in command, is being rude, thinks women are super unimportant and things. He he tries to bypass Yar at one point and he gets like knocked over for his trouble. So it's like, haha, you can be taken out by a woman. Yeah. Also, it's kind of really awkward how Yar just sort of like jumps at this guy. Like, mm-hmm. all right, this is a diplomatic thing and he's bringing a thing towards, you know, Picard there, but it's still sort of a that you were expecting this why are you all up in his face <laughs> yeah it's a weird one it's a we def we need these people to have a reason to interact yes we can't okay. think of one so uh suddenly yars there and <laughs> she's beating up this guy and lotan's like neat <laughs> yeah so lotan gives them a sample of the vaccine they go cool uh, later on in the conference room they present lutan a gift which is a priceless thousands of year old horse statue <laughs> Like, why are we just giving these things away to random aliens? Well, uh, maybe they found uh, like a whole warehouse of them on Earth at some point, And they're like, well, uh, we're kind of post-scarcity and nobody actually wants to hold on to these things. And all our museums are full. Uh, we'll hand them out to aliens. There we go. <laughs> so they talk about honor and respect and how that's the most important thing in their culture. Um, they also ask for a demonstration of the holodeck because they've heard that it can be used to do training programs and request that Yar take them to give a demonstration. She shows them a very, very boring looking Aikido program 
It does take down Hagen again, though, so he's 0 for 2. Yeah, so uh, Hagen is either a terrible number two bodyguard person or something like that, or Tosh Yar is just that much of a badass. It's kind of hard to tell. So after a particularly diplomatic ship tour, Lutan and his entourage are ready to head back. But just before they beam away, he grabs Yar and kidnaps her down to the planet. Yoink! It's like, well, maybe we should have, I don't know, done enough research about their culture to have a feeling if this is going to happen. But we'll do all the research now instead. Yeah, since they kind of, you know, know this later. <laughs> <laughs> So Picard displays some power, they blow up some torpedoes above the atmosphere and demand the return of the officer, but they don't get any reply at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Crusher shows up to remind them that there is in fact a ticking clock and people are dying off screen, so we need to, you know, deal with this. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is a thing that is very important and we should be stressing about, uh, you know, all this death and things like that. We're trying to prevent and be a little pissed off that this guy is just like, yeah, we. I'm going to do my weird game here or whatever, and yeah. Yeah. Also, Wesley gets to pretend to fly the ship now. We're continuing with yeah. his character growth in the middle of all of this. Yes. Uh, you know, go ahead and sit at ops, kid. Uh, it's not much we're doing here as far as ops goes, so you can't damage anything, I guess. So uh, Troy and Riker have been researching Ligonian culture, um, their honor code and values and things. Uh, basically... Kidnapping Yar was just a way to show off, like counting yeah. coup, which is something that we say way too often. I've heard this way too often. I don't think we really understand it, and, and we yeah. probably should stop throwing it around as something that's not in any way in our own culture at all. But, yes. <laughs> um, their understanding of it is that it's a way of gaining honor by attacking your a, a powerful opponent without actually harming them. You know, the I'm not touching you, but kind of touching you at the same time sort of move. Yes. Uh, finally, Lutan contacts them, and Picard demands Yar back before them remembering that he's supposed to ask politely, because it's their cultural thing. And he's invited to the planet in order to do so. Despite Riker's protest, Picard is the only one who can handle this, because according to their tradition, uh, Lutan would have to die rather than let anything happen to an honored guest leader like Picard. Oh no, Lutan dying? Whatever should we do if that were to happen? Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> So they beam down, they see that Yar is okay, and they meet Yorina, who is Lutan's first wife. Apparently, she's the only one that shows up, but they keep calling her the yeah. first wife. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe only has one, the one wife, but uh, you know, but you just still call them a, the first wife. In case they just you have, have plans. So. so Lutan invites him to a banquet later to publicly ask for Yar's return. Uh, after the feast, Picard does give a nice little political speech, request Yar back, but Lutan doesn't. Yeah, he's just like, yeah, I cannot. I have changed my mind because I have been smitten by this Tasha Yar, despite not really interacting with her other than seeing her beat up people. Yeah, he's like, I'm going to marry her and make her my first wife. And this is immediately challenged by Irina, who apparently has the right traditionally to challenge to a fight to the death, even though no one actually does that anymore. Yeah, and... Also, Yar doesn't really have any say in this other than to accept this challenge to the fight to the death thing. Picard initially refuses, but Lutan says that if they do, then there won't be any alliance or vaccine. Well, jeepers. Uh, is there anyone else on this planet we could talk to about vaccines? Or is this guy, like, <laughs> actually just in charge? Yeah, he seems to be in charge. I don't understand why this guy is in charge, <laughs> but he seems to be. Yeah, maybe his wife is the one with the most lands? Mm. Ah. So after dinner, Picard and Troy get to see Yar. Uh, Troy gets her to admit that she is attracted to Lutan, so eh. Yeah, so, but it's also, uh, Troy's like, I'm going to use my empathy powers to reveal this fact. This is true, isn't it? And, and Chosh is like, come on, Troy. Sure, but really? Like, why is this important at all? There's no, yeah, this, this is, yeah. has no bearing on the situation. It's it's this is something that's gotten kind of a theme uh, uh, running up until this point that Troy's kind of letting everyone know is like yes the uh, the uh, you know the locals here are all like you know kind of attracted to Tasha Yar and and uh, you know that's important and now she's like and now Tasha is attracted to this guy uh, why do we care Yeah, basically Troy's entire <laughs> role in this episode is to go well of course Lieutenant Yar is a very attractive woman. And of course, Lutan is a very attractive man. So uh, are you trying to say that Tasha has no choice but to follow a slight 
emotional response to this guy and become his wife? I guess. I mean, they do have him wandering around with half a shirt on the entire episode, but personally, I find the racism a little too distracting. A little bit, yeah. So the only option that they have, uh, it seems, is to accept the challenge because, you know, it'd be super easy to just kill everyone and take the vaccine, I guess would be the other option. But that pesky prime directive that we're going to keep bringing up and barely explaining. Yeah, it's like, well, if we uh, get it from context here, it's like, well, I guess we can't murder everyone. Yep. We have to follow their, this guy's ridiculous code of honor to the letter in order to be nice to people. And it's just so awkward. They want to turn it into a discussion about non-interference and respecting other cultures versus, you know, using your obviously superior firepower to not respect their culture. Mm -hmm. But all they do is like, you know what? I was just sitting here mulling over how easy this would be if we didn't have the Prime Directive. And then they go like, oh, you're right. The Prime Directive is pesky, but it's important. Okay, let's yep. move on now. Yep. Uh, so I guess we know the Prime Directive is still a thing at this point in Star Trek, I guess. <laughs> a little weird. Picard goes to talk to Lutan again and gets all broy with Lutan and Hagen and is able to thus learn Lutan's plans. See, he's not as powerful as he actually seems. He's very influential, but Yarina, being the woman, is the one who owns everything. So if mm -hmm. she leaves him, she takes all the land and he's now worthless. But if she dies, somehow that means that Lutan gets all of her land, I guess. I guess, yeah. Uh, closest married relative, I guess, situation. Yeah. It's a little and confusing. If she wins, then she's going to be invested in staying with him, and he still gets all the land. So he's in a win-win situation. Yeah, Irina, you could probably just like leave him right now for being kind of a dick. Yeah, I don't know how yeah. that works with the divorce thing, but yeah. Later, we get our first ever Jordy Data friend scene, which is fun because Data tries to tell jokes and Jordy tries to run away. <laughs> Yes, and it's made more awkward because Jordy you know, starts out the scene, uh, he's shaving, and he doesn't have his visor on. And so he can't see anything as Data's slowly quartering him, telling jokes at him. Yes, it's, I do it's love it. I love he, Data. Yeah. Data. Data and Jordy are my favorite Star Trek bro friends. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but definitely given the scene, it's like hard to believe that they become like the best friends ever later in the series. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, it's actually kind of nice. I know that a lot of people uh, talk about Data as like a good stand-in for a neurodivergent character because he's like mm -hmm. so awkward in this. He doesn't understand why what he's doing is making other people uncomfortable. And they're like, you know what? We're just going to teach you slowly. It's okay. Yeah. So Data and Jordy are requested to come down to the planet to examine the weapons that Yara might use. They're like, well, these have poison on them and they're super deadly and efficient. Also, they're very light. Like, women might use them. Oh, huh, because uh, all women are weak, I guess, is the implication? Hmm. Yeah, women can't use big, strong man weapons. They have to use super light ones. It's because... Ugh. Yeah. So uh, Yara spends a minute trying to talk Yarina out of fighting. I didn't realize how similar their names were until I had to keep saying them next to each other. <laughs> Yar, Yarina! <laughs> but uh, Yarina is cocky, and this really doesn't go anywhere, but at least we have established that our main characters are the good guys who are trying to avoid violence. Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the Tasha Yarina fight will transpire, but at least Tasha's shown herself as a uh, unwilling combatant, and uh, any secret lusting she has for Lotan is not going to uh, get in the way of her wanting to not kill people. Yep. So that's good. We get a bit more preparation, whine about how stuck Yar is and the predicament, etc., etc. Uh, they give her their weapons, which look like wasp stingers or something. They're just spiky fist balls. So the, the power fist of death? Yeah, also super poisoned. One touch mm -hmm. fatal type of poison. Oh no, uh, so don't scratch yourself with it. Uh. Yep, and then one final little bit of preparation. Data's sent back to the ship to tell them their super secret plan. Yes. You know, or to proceed, as the captain has said, also, we're going to cut before we say anything else. Also, Crusher's here. Yara and Yarina enter a jungle gym sort of combat thingy. Um, they fight. Yarina loses her weapon at one point, and they pause. It accidentally yes. kills a dude in the audience. They go, wait, pause. She dropped her weapon. It's like, I feel like that's probably fair game in this, but yeah, she got disarmed. It happens. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Also, at the beginning, you know, there will be no interruptions or no pausing, or whatever. There, and you, it's like, no, this. So, so you're pausing it now. What? This yep. doesn't seem like it's consistent at all. This was just so they could kill a random dude and go like, oh right, this is deadly. Oh my god. Mm-hmm. We didn't <laughs> believe them before. So uh, Hagen's concerned for Yarina's safety. Uh, Lutan's annoyed at this. Finally, Yar does land a killing blow and wins, but she immediately jumps on Yarina, and both are beamed away to see Dr. Crusher waiting for them in the transporter room. Well, maybe Tasha just thought uh, it was like a video game where the uh, the body flashes a few times and then vanishes. And it's like, maybe I can get out of here this way. And then suddenly they're beamed away instead. <laughs> <laughs> So Lutan is upset, but he has to admit that he did see Arena die and the no rules were broken. So Picard asks him to uh, agree that they begin beaming up the vaccine. And then he kidnaps Lutan and Hagen. So now everyone's kidnapping everyone. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we've captured you. You're on the ship. Uh, we're going to slowly walk you around to places. This is fine. So uh, back on the ship. Lutan sees Irina, who he's mad about, but everyone agrees that she did die. They, they saw her get poisoned. Yep. Dr. Crusher has the medical thingy that she did die, but she was able to resuscitate her. And apparently they have a very, very narrow definition of what till death do us part means on this planet. So as soon as her heart stopped beating, they're no longer married. Yes, but there's a weird inheritance clause with it. Mm, yeah, she she's like no longer <laughs> mated. They call it to Lutan, and uh, she also sees that uh, Hagen actually cared about her. So she's like, "Okay, I'm going to have Hagen as my first husband now, and he gets all my land and stuff, and you are ruined." Hooray! Take that, Lutan. She also goes like, "Hey, Yar, do you want Lutan? You fought for him." And she's like, "No, no, thank you." <laughs> now this guy's kind of a loser, uh, and also manipulative, a jack. Jackass. Yeah. What actually stinks is she doesn't do a no. That's ridiculous. She's a, I oh oh there'd be there'd be too many complications. Oh, but I would so like to. Yeah, Tasha, I I, I know you're just the character here, but uh, this is just so embarrassing. So Yarina decides to take Lutan as her second husband. Now she's in charge. Haha, we have toppled uh-huh. the patriarchy, I suppose. Uh, and all that dealt with, Picard would like to get out of this backward racist episode. So with that, mm-hmm. they fly away to Steerus 4. Yeah, uh, hopefully with the vaccine. Uh, but they're kind of like lazy about it. It's like, we should probably get underway. Why are we still here? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, we should probably like save people's lives and stuff. Uh, we. <laughs> so, <Okay>. uh, <laughs> yeah. Code of honor. That certainly was an experience. Interestingly, given the way that the episode was written and then the way that the episode ended up, I do think it really shows an important point of the sort of context and other more subtle things that really influence how racist or offensive or reinforcing of stereotypes something is. Because there's there's this constant argument right now, which... which ticks me off, bores me, and annoys me all at the same time. We we have to have this weird debate over whether something was like, just appears racist accidentally, whether someone's racist comments mean that they themselves are a racist. We have to keep having this constant thing of like, yes, this thing was racist, but the people who made it weren't racist, and we need to draw a very important distinction. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, sometimes folks are, you know, it's like, this is what I know is what you do in the situation. So this is what we're going to do. And they just were unaware of just how horrible things were, but they were not attending any harm by it. Other people do intend harm by it. So, you know, being, you know, mindful of, of you know, what's going on there is an important detail. There's a particular problem here, though, like, I'm just going to say, because this is an important point that we need to start from, especially in America, but also because this has been exported everywhere. You can you can say it fairly confidently about most places on Earth, but especially America, because we have our own dang brand of this stuff. We are all racist because we were all raised to be that way and taught to be that way and have a certain way of thinking that encourages racial hierarchies. And we need to be able to all identify that, in fact, we are all racist and behave in a racist way 
in order for us to identify those things and do our best to stop them and go against them. Indeed. So having some sort of debate of like, yeah, you did a racist thing, but does that make you the person a racist? It's like, yes, it does. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It does. Having this weird like, well, they just made a mistake, but they themselves are not racist is a very unhelpful distinction to be making. Yeah, it's 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 very much trying to cover up the underlying structure of how we've been raised and uh, all of that and being mindful of that of those realities does allow us to be more active in trying to counteract racism be it our own actions or those around us so you went in, you ran into an interesting situation with something like this cuz the 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 way that this was written was racist but in a unexamined way Yes. Like originally it was supposed to be sort of a samurai code thing, which is a different a different kind of racism, but it's still bringing in that sort of orientalism vibe. And then the rewrites that turned it into sort of a tribal thing are bringing in other racist motifs, also somewhat orientalist, uh, but they're bringing in at least a little bit of an African vibe here. But if yes. they'd kept it as lizards, if they'd kept them all as reptilian, non-human aliens then it would still just stop there it would be your kind of we're repeating an unexamined trope sort of racism which you should mm -hmm. still try to avoid because you should examine the tropes that you're repeating otherwise you are just going to wind up repeating the same racism that those tropes were initially based on but that one is one where you can say is more of ignorance the casting decisions are what actually tips this episode into uncomfortable more overt racism mm -hmm. because especially given that the director was purported to be behaving in a full-on racist way towards the actors themselves the decision to cast the entire alien species as african-american actors reinforces that not only do we have this, you know, somewhat african coded tribal culture, but also these, like, quote-unquote primitive non-American viewpoints of misogyny and honor codes and all these sorts of things are now linked to darker-skinned people, which mm -hmm. is not only just reinforcing the same trope, but also pinning that trope to a real-life depiction of people that we already use that trope against thus reinforcing the trope even more than if you had this but it's lizards so i i guess in some ways the lizard sort of casting is kind of a echo of the uh, original presentation of the klingons there that uh except it's like okay so we have something different going on with the klingons now maybe we could still have our all of these tropes wrapped up into a single species as we change the Klingons, but we make them non-human, so it's it's less bad, guys. Yeah, it's a very it's, weird it's one. Still bad. <laughs> Looking at the Klingons is, an, is a really interesting representation of this because it went the other direction. Like you said, like originally the Klingons were a very racist, orientalist trope, just sort of a stand-in for the general, you know, ang like evil communist Asian of the 1960s. Yes. Uh, they kept a lot of the Asian motif. They they modeled them specifically on a very Western romanticized idea of samurai like they meant to for this episode. Mm -hmm. um, but because they then added more obviously alien prosthetics and alien cultural elements, we then forget that some of this stuff is supposed to be based on modern ideas of Asian cultures. We start seeing it more as just a alien society. Um, that isn't to say that repeating these tropes is not still harmful, but unlinking it to a very obvious representation of a stereotype that is still being used against Asian people um, you you go from reinforcing a harmful stereotype against very specific people to mildly reinforcing the idea of an overused trope stereotype. Yes. So you you are slowly divorcing the two and that's better than nothing, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's better than nothing. You still have some problems inherent in it. 
I still haven't found. If anyone knows of this, I would very much like to read some other takes on this, but I still have not found whether there's any writing on people's feelings towards how the new Klingons with the more heavy facial prosthetics and things are considered as far as white actors playing a darker skinned alien race. I've, I've had trouble finding any explicit writing on that, and I'd be very interested if anyone had something they could point me toward. Yeah, so uh, if you uh, got any ideas there, feel free to leave them in the comments uh, as far as, you know, links and things like that. But this episode is not that, because they didn't even bother to to alienize them. They are they're mm-hmm. just humans. They have no prosthetics. They have costumes. But the costumes themselves aren't even particularly alien. Like we said, they're sort of a mishmash of various semi-African, semi-Eastern costuming. Yeah, this is very much a, oh no, we've run into another Earth-like planet that has people exactly like humans again. And even a little bit. I'm like I'm 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 saying it would still be bad, but even a minor facial prosthetic or something mm-hmm. would have helped make it cement cemented a little more in the these are aliens. This isn't just some randomly displaced African tribe. Indeed. Yeah, it would be, you know, that's like, okay, so it, it's just a weird coincidence that they happen to all be black. But, uh, you know, they're actually aliens. Um, uh, don't be angry, hopefully, maybe. Hmm. Yeah. It'd still be kind of really awkward, though, It's interesting. So. Yeah. It's really, really interesting to me to look at. And I don't have the, I don't have the background to do it the critical justice that it deserves. But the fact that you could look at this episode and say, if they had made them all fully made up lizard people aliens or if they had in fact just maybe done like the Vajoran thing where they cast just a, a a variety of of actors just just like people of a bunch of diff- with a bunch of different skin tones and mm-hmm. just give them like a minor prosthetic to link them all as an alien race then the episode would have moved from horribly obviously racist to why are we repeating these stupid tropes racist yes <laughs> which is you know, preferable to the obvious racism there but it is still sort of you know you know awkward um but uh, we i guess have a more interesting conversation as a result i think yeah we you, you could still have a lot of critiques of the representation of an honor based culture the uh, normalization of honor killing as some sort of weird cultural thing that that people sort of just innately move through on the way to civilized Western culture, which is kind of a head scratcher because cultures don't go from A to B to C. Yeah, that's that's always <laughs> the implication in episodes like this. Like here is a culture that's very similar to an old Earth culture, and at some point during the episode, they will say explicitly. We used to be like this, but now we have evolved to be better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, determinism like that is very common in Star Trek, and we'll run into it a lot as we go forward still. Yeah. So. You always have a very, very deterministic view of cultural progression of it will start in this very particular, usually racially coded, uh, misogynistic, possibly racist, though they don't put that one into alien cultures as much in Next Generation uh, but usually misogynistic, generally has some version of an honor code. Um, and, and it's always like presented as, well, this non-Western society is obviously backward and primitive, but we need to respect them because eventually they will be exactly like us. So uh, we'll have friends eventually, but we just have to wait until they get there. We're in fact going to hit this in the next episode as well. They very specifically say... How can we hate who we used to be? They will improve. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm also not looking forward to that one. <laughs> it is an interesting view of respecting other cultures. It's saying you should respect other cultures because eventually it will become your culture. Or we could respect cultures because they are their cultures. And they are, this is how these people are going, you know, are living their lives. And respecting people is part of respecting their culture. Yeah, and you run into a very particular <laughs> problem. Well, I'm not saying that there are that there is a fully analogous culture on Earth. Nobody, as far as I'm aware, has this weird system of particular misogyny and and this weird fight to the death honor killing thing happening. 
Uh, and any cultural practice that perpetuates bigotry and the dehumanization of parts of the population should be called out because there's a difference mm -hmm. in respecting someone's culture and normalizing oppression. Yes. Other parts of this culture that are presented, like the obviously overblown and unrealistic honor code that they have, they explicitly say is based on things that they believe exist in the real world. So what you are implying by taking something that you would admit you took from a real world earth culture and then displaying it as culturally primitive as a, just a stepping stone to get to our obviously superior Western culture, you are very specifically calling out that you believe that other countries and other cultural practices are simply more primitive versions of our own obviously superior western culture yes and uh it's also combined with the uh these folks are technologically advanced but not as technically technologically advanced as us than the federation so it's sort of you know another linkage there as far as you know you know these folks are being implied to be just generally lesser yeah and they have this uh technological anachronism that they always demonstrate in cultures that you are supposed to perceive as less advanced. Well, they obviously have transporters, and that would possibly imply replicators. They don't say specifically, but obviously they've reached the level of technology to invent a transporter, which is so far beyond our current level of technology, it is basically unthinkable at this point. It's magic for us. <laughs> but they still live in what is coded to be older architecture they're still using fires every single part of their planet's culture is coded to be non-technological there is not visible technology anywhere indeed you know except maybe the lights they you know the newest thing from ikea yeah you have lamps <laughs> now the uh, the the external shot of uh, the i guess the big castle meeting hall place is like this is like uh, an old stone and uh, clay sort of structure uh, with a vaguely African sort of vibe to it. But this is the, the tallest point in the city, apparently, and the, you know, the big uh, crown jewel of it all. And, you know, that's where they're going to be sort of focusing their architecture here. And so, yeah, this is supposed to be implied that this city is basically stone and uh, you know, dirt, which... Kind of sucks. Oh, yeah, that was a choice. Yeah, and I'm not saying, because people always get into these arguments, there exist now modern societies with a level of technology like equal to the what we have here in the United States mm -hmm. that embrace more traditional looking architecture and i think that's great yeah. because we're we're moving together some like in the u.s right now we're moving towards some architectural design ideas that i hate personally yeah. it's an aesthetic <laughs> thing and i admit that but i hate it oh i i got i got i got a friend who can also point out what's awful in it in a very technical this is bad for everyone sense too so uh, mm -hmm. maybe we can have him on the show sometime <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there are different architectural styles and some architectural styles do tend to embrace what one might think of as more traditional architectural designs for whatever mm -hmm. region they happen to be in but yeah. if you look at it narratively as the way that a tv show is trying to communicate a certain mm -hmm. thing to you you can compare the way that they show a planet like this to later in the season we'll have depictions of earth with very very future modern architecture and not just that but obvious signs of technology everywhere like Indeed. flying flying shuttles and things just in every shot traffic like like skyscrapers everything is very metallic the interiors are metallic it looks like the ship there are control panels and computers everywhere yeah, just tossed up in places you know all uh you now this planet here is uh well, you you got a, a wall covered in weapons and um, some sigils for the local planets, uh, you know, the governments, I guess, and uh, and that's kind of it as far as you know details there. Yeah, I'm not trying to say that you wouldn't make a palace look like older stone architecture, and you might even hide your computer interfaces and things to achieve a more architectural design. But narratively, they are decentering the technological progress of these people as opposed to the more western coded white ship that we are supposed to be on the side of indeed 
So, uh, you know, it's, it's something that is possibly explainable in universe, but what we're being presented with, yeah, it's, it's very, very clear in its messaging. Yeah. Presenting the stuff in universe is fun. And I agree coming up with explanations for why things work culturally or technologically in universe is fun, but it distracts from the narrative messaging, the visual messaging that you have inherent to these kinds of mediums. The entire mm-hmm. reason that television and movies is its own distinct form of visual storytelling is because the visuals that you put on screen communicate something to the audience, and you should be mindful of what you're putting on screen and what you're communicating to the audience with that. Yes, you know, it, it would have been very easy to have to 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 have a little bit of both. You know that these folks are highly technologically advanced. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, we're also, also really keen on this sort of architectural sort of styles by having someone, you know, clearly operating a terminal and then closing it. And it just looks like a normal wall sort of situation. Yeah. You could have any number of things, but the, the general point that they have in this episode is these people are technologically advanced enough to, if not participate in, understand interstellar travel Mm -hmm. and have transporter technology these are the two things that we completely and explicitly know about them both of those things put them so unimaginably far ahead of our own level of technology it is unthinkable how they got there but everything that we see on the planet would put them decades behind our current level of technological progress yes uh pretty much worldwide there yeah it's a little a little ridiculous (laughs) so that's what i'm saying like even that everything in this episode is coded to some sort of racist stereotype. But the casting itself is what pushes it over. Because now you have not only put in all of these like general racist stereotypes, the like what we consider to be a less evolved culture, the blatant misogyny, the archaic honor code, and the apparent lack of modern technology and conveniences. And instead of those just being some general tropes that you use to communicate something about an alien culture, you have now explicitly linked it to this is the place that you wind up with brown-skinned people. Yes. And in fact, this is the only planet where the majority appears to be non-white. Yeah. <laughs> Except for maybe the Klingons, I guess. <laughs> yeah, as far as I can explicitly remember, having not rewatched the series in a minute, this is the only only planet where you have this level of humanoid alien who are completely cast as people of color yes and uh you know there's you know bullions don't count folks just just fyi (laughs) now you could say that is because they learned something from this episode but also you could have a technologically superior planet with a superior peace-loving fully pacifist amazing artsy culture Mm -hmm. and also cast it entirely with an african-american cast that's something that you fully could do they didn't Uh, heck later in the season i think it is uh there's a planet where they that is technologically hyper advanced and is all about the art and culture and stuff and they're all white people what if you just flip that yeah you could have done that (laughs) could have done that uh, and uh, I, I could also mention uh, Justice, where there's this planet of, you know, it looks sort of technologically advanced, but apparently they don't have space travel uh, and everyone's just busy having sex all the time. Uh, but uh, the crew is really excited for this. So they're going to go on vacation there, maybe. And then a plot happens. Uh, and, you know, maybe that maybe you could have racially flipped that. No, that would turn out but bad. Stead, there's yeah, a lot of reasons yeah, that would turn yeah, out bad. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that'd be terrible, actually. In fact, that whole episode's bad, too. Uh, yeah. yeah. But they avoided racism we'll that by casting it. <laughs> it all with white people. The casting is way too white in that episode, but it is good that they avoided the racial overtones that they could have gotten to. Uh, there, there's different sort of racial overtones, though, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to justice. Yeah, which is not too long here. So. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, but yeah, even in this season, though, uh, there was at least a couple options where they could have ha- had made some different choices to basically try to make up for this episode. But still, it's sort of like, maybe we should have just a, a racially mixed sort of planet situation whenever we run into somebody. That might be a 
better way to go for going forward. Yeah, it could be. They yeah. usually do that. So I think that they may have learned a lesson here, but they learned the wrong lessons. And, you know, the fact that they decided to exclusively cast an African-American guest cast for this episode and that they it doesn't seem to have ever occurred to them to do it again is also a very telling thing. I mean, this is also the 80s. It's like, you know, 40... Uh, yeah, geez, it's way too long ago at this point. I'm getting old, Gepwin. Yeah. Stop time, I mean, please. This, this is most of the way through the 80s, but you know, the 18, uh, 1980 was 40 years ago at this point. But um, no, I'm not saying we've advanced a ton since then, but I think we have become a little bit more aware of how things are being depicted in media. Yes. One thing I did notice, though, uh, in this episode, that Worf is missing. That is true. Yeah. I wonder why. I wonder if Michael Dorn's like just looks at the scripts like I'm out, <laughs> or they couldn't think of a reason for him to be there, or maybe they didn't want to confuse us with too many mm. people of color on the ship. Yeah, that's also terrible. Maybe we can only have one violently coded, dark skinned person around. And other than that, we have Jordy, and you know that's our contrast for the episode. Ta-da! Yay! <laughs> hmm. So. I don't really know if there's anything else to talk about with this. This is the problem. Yeah, I feel like we've had two white guys talking about racism for quite long enough today. Yeah. So. Uh, so, yeah, if if folks are, are thinking about doing a rewatch of Star Trek's Next Generation, my recommendation with regard to this episode is skip. Yeah, I don't think there's anything too good about it. Yeah. I, I think the only moment of real character building that like matters at all uh is very slight and that's picard being kind of put off by uh data's calling french obscure yeah <laughs> it's like data do you do you really realize that you know given the universal tr t uh, translator picard's probably speaking in french this entire time <laughs> <laughs> just fyi but yeah it's it's and maybe that's like they, they do better uh sort of uh, demonstrations of that cultural background of him better in other episodes so yeah so uh, my recommendation is a big skip as i said before there's a reason you know this you know this is the episode i tend to skip when i do my own rewatch uh, but i did rewatch it for for you guys here uh and uh it still hurts deep down inside uh, yeah. my soul it's 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 it's, it's sore from the experience <laughs> <sighs> okay mm. We've talked about racism for about 40 minutes, so it's probably time for the galaxy's favorite game show! Woo! Let's hope it'll be better! Well, we folks, that was just a terrible episode. Um, mm. But welcome to the galaxy's favorite game show, where our various contestants have... Uh, Racked up some pri uh, points here, and uh, we got surprises to hand out, but uh, actually, it's probably the lowest uh, point score I've had in a while. Um, but anyway, uh, let's kick this off here with the Bad Psychic Friend Prize, which goes to Troy for revealing Tosh's inner feelings about Lotan. Kind of a dick move, Troy. Well, it, you're you're half alien, but really, you could you should be able to at least empathize a little bit more uh, with uh, Tosh all for this one here. What does she win, Gep? One. Troy wins one of the psychic blocking things from any member of media. The one I always vote to is the weird janky looking one from Fallout. But because at this point her psychic thing is broken, she's not sensing other people's emotions and empathy. She's sensing random misogynist tropes. Yeah. Troy, you might want to get your, uh, uh, your psychic powers examined or adjusted or uh, I don't know. Go back to actual empathy a little bit. Maybe you'll feel that, you know, you know, realize, oh, everyone here is really being feeling awkward over the situation and, uh, yeah, and maybe not contribute. Hmm. Anyway, the next prize is the one hit point wonder prize, which goes to everybody hanging out during the battle to the death part of the show. And, uh, yeah, because, you know, one, one bit of poison and you're just dead. And no one cares. Anyway, yeah, but what do they win? They win a potion of greater restoration. It's the best way to just purge all poisons, status effects, etc. Hmm. I could certainly use a few of those, uh, you know, both for my characters in D&D &D as well as real life. Uh, though I'm not poisoned, I hope. Hmm. Anyway, uh, the last prize is the What Were They Thinking prize, which goes to the director, Russ Mayberry, 
uh, for the racism and Catherine Powers for the oh golly strong primitive man nonsense. What do they win, Gepwin? They win being fired, but they were already fired. So good job. Hooray! <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's all we got here for uh, this week. Uh, I I tried to come up, find a few more prizes to hand out, but uh, unfortunately, the, there's just nothing here to really rack up good points on here. So, uh, uh, I'm done, Gepwin. Take us away, please. Yes, thank you all for sitting through this nonsense and uh, putting up with what we call the galaxy's favorite game show. <laughs> It's just so weird how they wrote some of the dialogue this episode. It's like, even without everything else, it's like, we're going to awkwardly exposized about stuff now. Yeah, this uh, this this season doesn't have its dialogue down. No. There's, there's, there's not really any particular, like, yes, this is the way that you write Star Trek about season one. <laughs> There's some better episodes. I will admit there's some better episodes. Some episodes that I keep forgetting were in season one because I like them so much. But, like, overall, <laughs> it's not well be. written. Uh, I think as far as, like, uh, you know, uh, acting, uh, Patrick Stewart to Brett Spiner are on their A-game for this one. Uh, uh, you know, LeVar Burton, uh, you know, being awkward around data as he's telling his jokes is uh, pretty good. But uh, you know, uh, you know Jesse Lawrence Ferguson, despite what he's been given as far as material, is doing his best. And you know, we we, we should make sure to remember not to punish the actors here who are basically given a a, a a wheelbarrow full of manure to deal with. As far as I know, yeah. I mean, it's amazing given what they had, given that they had the mm-hmm. way that I know they were treated on set for at least part of it, mm-hmm. like. The the guest like that is one of the only reasons I would say it's worth watching this episode because like mm-hmm. the guest stars in this episode are bringing way more than anyone deserves. Yes, yeah, we're gonna you know try to sell the hell out of this, even though you know it's you know the the sow's ear per situation. Yep. Okay, <sighs> we are moving from. I just to add that. <laughs> uh, while this next episode is better, much much better remembered. Uh, at the time, mm-hmm. it was actually rated much, much lower, like, yes, critically. Uh, it's still awkward, but just not as awkward as, as, you know, Code of Honor is. Yeah. So next episode is called The Last Outpost, where we finally see the rumored main antagonist of Next Generation, the species that has been set up, been been foreshadowed, been mentioned, been like, oh my god, what what is this mysterious force in the galaxy? The Ferengi Empire. Dun, dun, dun. Or Alliance. I forget Fire. what they said in Farpoint. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, they just called them the Ferengi. Maybe we'll make a deal with them. You know, these people that you're obviously antagonized with uh, that you know very little about. Maha. Yep. But you know, they're like, Groppler Zorn, what's up? And they're like, oh, I was just kind of bluffing. Right. Yeah. yeah. We've heard the rumors. <laughs> we've heard rumors. No one has ever seen them. They've had very little contact. There's just a mysterious force equal to the federation out there somewhere called the ferengi yes and they're powerful and uh have uh, the ability to uh, reach far if they so wish and their technological capabilities could even outmatch the federation mm-hmm. potentially yeah so uh, watch out for that so next uh the last outpost first appearance of the ferengi uh the episode that armin sherman publicly apologized for yes <laughs> Something about hamsters, I think there was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, um, some. If, if you're gonna watch this before we before we do the next episode, because we have to, look forward to some truly bizarre physical acting choices. I'll say that. Yes. I. Yes. I mean, it's all. It's almost worth watching, just for the. Why did you make that acting decision? What What possessed you? There's a a reason that uh, in uh, the second episode of Lower Decks they explicitly make a joke about uh, this sort of uh, you know behavior. Uh, it's like we're going to reference the name of this episode explicitly. Yep, because you're just being so ridiculous here. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, next time the Frangie show up in Last Outpost. Look forward to that. <laughs>
Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow, the dreaded Ferengi appear. Woo! <laughs>have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcast, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more, and where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on youtube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Isix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Isix and Twitter at IsixLP. Music is Waveform and More is Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs>